Okay, can everybody hear me and see the screen? I hope so. Um, well, the, the talk I'm going to give tonight um, started life as a, a piece of entertainment, really, for the um, Newcastle Society of Antiquaries. I'm just working out how to move on to the next slide. Um, a sister society of the London Society, um, the oldest um, provincial society of its type in England, founded in uh, 1813, um, and which possesses a remarkable collection of Roman stones and sculptures from Northern Britain and, and Hadrian's Wall. And amongst them, a, a stone that I'll be talking about this evening. Um, so, uh, as I say, uh, casting round to do something to compensate for the fact that um, we had to abandon our live lectures in the early part of the year, I lighted upon this as something um, with, with great relevance uh, to our times. Um, I have to say that the talk is based, as you'll see, to a large extent on the work of other scholars, other researchers. That gives it something of the nature of what in the journalistic trade is known as a cuttings job. Uh, but if, it's, if it succeeds in drawing attention to a um, often forgotten, neglected, piece of great importance in, in the collection of the Society of Antiquaries of Newcastle, it'll have served its purpose. So, um, the stone in question comes from Housesteads on Hadrian's Wall. Um, you see Hadrian's Wall towards the top of the map there, I hope, and um, Housesteads is more or less in the middle of the wall. So it's in the remote upland area. Um, there it is, uh, situated on its uh, volcanic ridge overlooking de desolate lands to the north. Um, and because of its remote location, it has um, a, a remarkable collection of um, inscribed stones and sculptures which uh, survived on the site um, into the 18th century in a way that um, wasn't usual on other sites on the more agricultural parts of Hadrian's Wall. The stone in question um, is this fine inscribed slab, um, number 1579 in the Roman, inscription, Roman inscriptions of Britain Corpus, first recorded at Housesteads in 1807, and now to be seen in the Great North Museum, Hancock, in Newcastle upon Tyne, or at least to be seen there at such a time as the museum is able to reopen. It's a simple dedication by the first cohort of tongues stationed at Housesteads. Um, but despite its simplicity, in a remarkable, remarkable way, this text links a religious act carried out in Northumberland with distant Asia Minor. Uh, the text reads, Dies diabusque secundum interpretationem oroculi clari apollinis cohors prima tingrorum translates as to the gods and goddesses according to the interpretation of the oracle of the Clarion Apollo. This stone was set up by the first cohort of Tungrians. Claros, on the Aegean coast of Ionia, um, the Roman province of Asia, now Western Turkey, was the site of a sanctuary of Apollo where an oracle could be consulted. 
Um, today, it's possible to visit the excavated temple. Um, in fact, it's one of the most um, uh, beautiful, secluded, um, and evocative classical sites to be visited. Um, I'll just skip over that. This is the excavated temple of Apollo at Claros. Um, and you can see in, in the foreground, in the lower half of the slide, this, you're looking into the substructure of the temple. The, the actual building above ground has disappeared. Um, but in, beneath the temple, in the substructure, you can see um, a series of water-filled passages. Um, and these lead to the underground chamber from which the wisdom of the oracle emanated or was thought to emanate. Now, the oracular industry at Claros, and it really was an industry, um, was at its peak in the second century AD when delegations from distant cities came to ask questions of the clarion version of, of the god Apollo. Um, above ground, a specialist staff of interpreters uh, would have helped, um, and no doubt at a great price, um, the inquirers to make sense of the sometimes obscure answers that came out from the oracle, um, answers to the questions they'd asked. And that's why we have this word interpretatio in the um, Housestead's text, um, wh where it reads, um, if we just, I'll just go back to the actual text, you can see um, in the first and second and third lines, secundum interpretationem, the, the Latin means according to the interpretation of what the oracle had said. And evidently this interpretation had said that a dedication should be made to all the gods and goddesses. Uh, but why, and, and why was this done at Housesteads? Um, Incidentally, uh, before um, I move on to explain why it was done at Housesteads, uh, just to say anybody wanting to um, find out more about the remarkable story of the Oracle at Claros and its importance in the um, a ancient world, will find a, a remarkably um, accessible account of it in the book by Robin Lane Fox, Pagans and Christians. Um, the, the actual knowledge of the, of the temple and what went on there, we owe to the researchers of the great French epigraphist Louis Robert, who, who researched the site and its inscriptions. Anyway, um, publishing the inscription in 1840, the first to publish it uh, properly in, in detail, um, a founding member and first secretary of the Newcastle Antiquarian Society, um, the county historian of Northumberland, um, a namesake of mine, but no relative, John Hodgson, um, he pondered what difficulty could have befallen the first Tungrian cohort at Borcovicus, as Housesteads was then known, um, to induce them to solicit a solution of it from the Oracle of Apollo. Had the, so the, he posed this question and couldn't really come up with an answer to it. And in fact, it was only um, in quite recent times that, that somebody hit on the answer. So had the cohort at Housesteads sent a delegation all the way to Western Turkey to ask the Oracle a question? Um, well, the answer to this is no, for the text is in fact a standard one. And at least 12 
almost identical dedications are known from various parts of the empire, including uh, besides Britain, Dalmatia, North Africa, Sardinia, Spain, Italy, and Asia Minor. And it was the historian C.P. Jones who first uh, showed convincingly uh, in 2005 that these dedications were a general initiative, probably ordered by the Emperor Marcus Aurelius um, in the 160s, who had perhaps himself consulted the oracle about what could be done to protect cities and military bases throughout the empire from devastating pandemic disease. The great Antonine play of that time, uh, as it's usually known, um, reached Rome in 166, and the infection was rife um, in the Western, pro throughout the Western provinces by 167. Contemporary descriptions are vague. It's uncertain what the disease actually was. The majority view is that it was a form of smallpox. The army returning from a war waged by Marcus's co-emperor Lucius Verus against the Parthian Empire, seated in what is now Iran, is said to have unwittingly spread the plague to the Western Empire. And you can see from this um, map showing the Roman frontier, uh, the, the frontier of the Roman Empire running from the east uh, through the, the Balkans, um, Central Europe, uh, up the Rhine to Britain, the route that the returning army would have taken, um, bringing the plague with it as it, as it moved. Where the plague, this plague had ultimately originated is unknown. Uh, Chinese sources indicate plague there in the same general period, uh, but rather than starting there, the suggestion has been made that the disease spread both east and west from some unknown point in Central Asia. Now, plagues and pestilences were of course commonplace in the ancient world and are often barely noticed by contemporary writers. And historians continue to debate um, how much impact the Antonine Plague actually had, um, but most believe that it stands out by virtue of the number of records that we have of it, that it was clearly much more widespread and vir virulent than usual. Um, the, the most detailed treatment of the evidence is by Richard Duncan Jones. And in a, a recent article in the um, Scandinavian journal Arctos, uh, 2018, he has um, reiterated his argument that this really was the, the amongst the most serious of um, pandemics to affect um, the Roman Empire and that it had um, far-reaching uh, damaging implications. Writing over two centuries after the event, the fourth century historian Ammianus Marcellinus uh, described how the Antonine Plague, and I quote, polluted everything with contagion and death from the frontiers of Persia all the way to, Rhine, uh, to the Rhine and to Gaul. Now, Ammianus does not specifically mention Britain. And it's probably for this reason that the Antonine Plague has never really featured in modern histories of Roman Britain. Um, and the belief being that it didn't quite get here. But there is now evidence other than the Housestead inscription that the island was not immune and that we would expect, um, as, we, as we would expect, given the level of cross-channel military movement, trade and official traffic uh, 
that uh, regularly took place. In 2014, uh, Roger Tomlin published um, this inscribed pewter amulet found at Vintry on the foreshore of the Thames in London. Now this is a tiny strip of metal. Um, the um, inscription that you see on the, the screen in front of you is only um, two inches wide. And it was designed to be rolled up and placed in a small cylindrical case, uh, perhaps to be worn round the neck and to offer protection to the bearer. Um, the inscription tells us that this belonged to a man of Greek origin uh, named Demetrios. The inscription is in Greek, um, but make, the mistakes in it um, indicate that it was the work of a scribe from the Latin West. And the fact that it's made of pewter suggests very strongly that it was in fact made in Britain. And what it is, what the text is, uh, I can't take you through it, um, but um, the, the gist of it is, it's, it's, a, it's a poem, a hexameter poem, invoking magical protection against the plague. Just to give a sample of Tomlin's translation, um, we read that uh, it, 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 it should send away the discordant clatter of a raging plague, airborne, infiltrating pain, heavy spiriting, flesh wasting, melting from the hollows of the veins. So besides giving a description of the flesh wasting disease itself, the language is interesting in showing an awareness that the contagion was somehow airborne and inhabitants of the empire, we can envisage them holding cloths to their faces in just the same way that we see so many uh, by instinct uh, as well as by compulsion wearing masks uh, in, in our world in 2020. Uh, the description of the plague as a cloud was a cliche in ancient writings of this kind. Um, another of the hexameters on this amulet reads, um, uh, well, yes, now this is, the, uh, this is where we come to a, a critical point. For another of the hexameters on, on the amulet reads, Phoebus, that is Apollo, of the unshorn hair, archer, drive away the cloud of plague. Now this wording with its mention of the unshorn archer Apollo immediately connects this text with one Alexander of Abonotikos, a place in Northern Asia Minor, who presided over the cult of Glycon, a supposed manifestation of the healing god Asclepios in the form of a snake. Glycon was said to issue oracles and Alexander claimed to be the interpreter. And this cult achieved widespread popularity in Eastern regions and was even patronized by the emperor Marcus Aurelius himself. We know so much about it because of an account by the contemporary writer Lucian, uh, which didn't, the purpose of which was to denounce Alexander as a charlatan. Lucian's work preserves a magical verse supposedly voiced for Glycon by Alexander and circulated by him with the assurance that it would offer protection against specifically the Antonine plague. It was to be placed over the doorways of houses, Lucian says. Uh, and the verse is, um, Apollo of the unshorn hair, uh, 
keeps away the cloud of plague. This is so closely related to the wording of the London amulet as to make it virtually certain that it was the Antonine plague with which its wearer Demetrios was concerned and that magical precautions against its devastation were also therefore being taken in Britain. Other measures were prescribed by the Oracle at Claros, and some of these may also have gone along with the instruction to dedicate to all the gods and goddesses that we've seen at Housesteads. Um, besides mass sacrifices, uh, the erection of statues of the archer Apollo, whose arrows would shoot down the airborne plague, was a standard prescription from the Oracle. We know this from inscriptions uh, at various uh, cities in the empire, for example, at Herapolis of Phrygia in Asia Minor, an inscription preserves an oracle issued in response to the Antonine Plague, part of which says, before all the gates, consecrate a holy statue of Clarion Phoebus, that is Clarion Apollo, equipped with bow bows that destroy plague. Um, at the town of Caesarea Trocheta in Lydia, also Asia Minor, um, part of one of the Clarion Apollo's oracles on the plague is preserved. Here also the citizens were told to set up a statue of Apollo the archer with his bow. The image of the archer Apollo is vividly evoked as we've seen by that little amulet in, in London. So to return to the inscription on the screen in front of us from Housesteads, the close association of it with the Antonine Plague of 165 onwards um, is obviously of great, great interest for a number of reasons. On a very basic level, um, to archaeologists and historians of Hadrian's War, it becomes the earliest explicit evidence we have for the presence of the named unit, the first cohort of Tungrians at this fort, making it virtually certain that they were stationed there by the beginning of Marcus Aurelius's reign in 161, and increasing the likelihood that the fort had in fact been built for them under the Emperor Hadrian. Uh, previously, um, this inscription and others that mention the Tungrians at Housesteads were all thought to be of the third century, rather later, associating this stone with the Antonine Plague um, bring, brings it immediately into the 160s. Another thing of great interest is that this inscription like in fact all of its analogues elsewhere in the empire, is not from a, an altar. It's not a, it, it's, it's not a re religious dedication of an altar, but it's a, on a recessed panel in a slab. Um, it's quite a big thing, over a meter in height um, and just under a meter in breadth as you see it. It's obviously designed either to be set into the wall of a substantial structure or, or into some kind of statue base with the intention of uh, protecting against or warding off the plague. Remember that verse of Alexander of Ap Abono Tychos, which was intended to be set over doorways. The proportions of it, 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 taller than it's wide, make it look like possibly something off a statue base, very unlikely to have been placed over one of the fort gates, for example, where you would normally expect inscriptions to be much wider than they are deep. It could have been built into some part of the headquarters building at Housesteads, but conceivably, 
it was set into the base of an image of Apollo as so frequently prescribed by the oracle. Now in this connection, also from Housteads and also in the uh, society's collection, um, there is in fact a well-known relief of an archer. Um, here he is, usually said to be a tombstone of a soldier from a regiment of archers. But no such unit was ever stationed at Housesteads. The figure, as you may be able to see, carries an axe-like object, as well as a finely delineated composite bow. Um, the axe-like object, perhaps making him more likely to be a god of some kind than a deceased soldier. Could he in fact be a, a local interpretation of the archer Apollo? The proportions of the relief are about right for it to have been set above the inscription that I've shown you. But um, this is, it has to be said, uh, speculation. Now, just over two years ago, in 2017, a wholly new light was cast on the house dead inscription by the discovery of another dedication erected in accordance with the Clarion Oracle um, at another fort in Northern Britain. So the plot thickens. Now here, um, you need to move your eye um, to the left of Hadrian's Wall, and you see um, beneath it and projecting into the Irish Sea, the Lake District area. And on the coast, the, the lowest fort that you see on the coast there has the name Ravenglass. And this is where um, this lately discovered inscription comes from. Here is the inscription. Um, as I say, from Ravenglass, a fort on the Cumbrian coast, the stone actually found, uh, reused at uh, the, the, the nearby medieval Moncaster Castle. Only a fragment survives, as you can see, uh, but the remaining letters suggest that the text was identical to that at Housestead. Uh, in the second line, you can see the end of the word secundum, that's followed by what looks like a P on the photograph, but is in fact an I, the beginning of interpretationem. You can see the N-E-M of that word in the third line, and you can actually see the A-R-I of um, Clary, um, referring to the Apollo of Claros in, in the bottom part of the stone. The only difference with this stone is that the name of the unit making the uh, dedication is different. That's fragmentarily preserved in the top line. And of course it would be different because it's a different fort garrisoned by a different unit. Again here, significantly the inscription is on a thin slab for setting into a structure and not on an altar. We've seen that the same oracle led to the erection of similar inscriptions at various places in the Western as well as the Eastern Empire. And that this may have been the result of the emperor consulting the oracle and the interpretation uh, being issued as a text with the instruction that it be displayed in cities and forts everywhere. Now the discovery of the Ravenglass example must engender the suspicion that every military unit in the empire, or at least in certain areas of the empire, was directed by the emperor to make such a dedication in accordance with the oracle. Marcus Aurelius would have good reason for doing this. The arrival of the plague had coincided with the onset of the great northern so-called Marcomannic Wars 
against invaders from north of the Danube. The military situation um, in the late 160s, early 170s became so desperate and the army so debilitated by the plague that according to one of the more reliable lives in, in the Historia Augusta, Marcus, and I quote, zealously revived the worship of the gods and trained slaves for military service. He armed gladiators also and turned even the bandits of Dalmatia and Dardania into soldiers. In that quote, the mention of the revival of the worship of the gods distinctly recalls the dedication to the gods and goddesses that we see on um, all of these inscriptions, including the one at Houston's. It should be said also that there is uh, a parallel in Britain for the erection of a standard dedicatory text at um, every fort uh, by every military unit. Um, the parallel lies in a well-known series dating to the year 213, protestations of loyalty to the Emperor Caracalla ordered by the governor Caius Julius Marcus, uh, presumably because he was suspected of plotting a move against the emperor. In fact, he was eliminated shortly afterwards. Um, but uh, his, his set um, protestation of loyalty is, is known from uh, a, a good dozen or more forts in, in Northern Britain. So here we have epigraphic evidence from London, Housesteads and Ravenglass, which leads us to the conclusion that the great Antonine plague had in fact reached Britain, despite what uh, most histories of Roman Britain tell us. So we may ask ourselves um, whether any other indications of the Antonine plague are to be found in Britain. Historians have pointed to a cessation or fall off in certain series of documents or inscriptions in various parts of the empire that seem to coincide with the peak of the plague around 167. Um, this is most clearly seen in the issue of the so-called diplomas, that is inscribed bronze tablets certifying the citizenship of discharged auxiliary soldiers. Um, these come out pretty regular, pretty much annual intervals, um, and greater and greater numbers of them are known as the years go by because of the practice of uh, metal detecting. Um, but the issue of them does cease abruptly um, at this time, uh, resumes later, but there's a great gap after the year 167. Now this is an empire-wide phenomenon and um, most of these diplomas are actually found outside Britain. But Britain itself offers something that recalls this um, sudden break in a regular series of inscriptions. And we see this at the fort of Maryport, um, also on the Cumberland coast, um, ju just a short distance north of the fort at Ravenglass, which is a fine, fine spot of the inscription just discussed. And at Maryport, what we have um, is a well-known series of altars, a uh, whole cache of them um, known and preserved because they were found buried together in, in pits. Um, altars dedicated probably annually to uh, Jupiter Optimo Maximo, Jupiter the best and the greatest, by the commanding officers of the three successive units stationed at Maryport 
in the second century. Um, the, the altars, uh, which can be seen in the museum at uh, Mer the Senhouse Museum in Maryport, um, they seem to preserve the full sequence of names of the commanding officers of the first court of Spaniards throughout the reign of Hadrian, that's from 122 to 138. Um, the uh, series continues into the reign of Antoninus Pius, 138 to 161, uh, during which a different unit, the first cohort of Dalmatians, garrisoned the fort. Now, here we have fewer altars, only four in fact, um, but that's because for most of this period, uh, the unit had moved into Scotland, which was um, briefly reinvaded under Antoninus Pius. Finally, a third unit, the first cohort of Bitasians, whose name you can see um, on the second and third lines of the two altars um, on the screen in front of you. Um, they take over the series, and this is after the abandonment of the Antonine Wall in Scotland, the return to Hadrian's Wall, and the re-garrisoning of Maryport, um, which occurred probably about 161. But after only two commanding officers who dedicated altars four and two times respectively, the series of altars ceases abruptly. Um, you, on, on the illustration in front of you, you have two of the very latest altars. These are dedicated by a prefect named Titus Attius Tutor, a prefect of the first court of Bitasians. And he's one of these last two um, commanding officers. Uh, after that, there is silence. Now, these commanding officers tended to have a term of about three years. Um, so if, 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 if you um, accept, it seems most likely that the Bitesians were at Maryport from 1-6 onwards, 161 plus two terms of three years gives you that um, evocative date 167 which coincides so neatly with the um, peak of the Antonine Plague. And that's when suddenly the, this series of altars at Maryport comes to an end. It's tempting to associate the cessation of this series with the effects of the plague. There are other possible reasons. As we've seen, this was also a time of acute military crisis. Um, and for all we know, the unit may have been transferred from Maryport for, for other reasons. There is another possible indication, in, again, in the Hadrian's Wall area. Um, the mid-160s is the most likely time when work was suspended on the building of the great structure, the so-called Site 11 at Corbridge. And Corbridge is um, a Roman military site just south of Hadrian's Wall that in this period was being converted into a great supply base and marketing center. Uh, and this involved the beginning of work um, with really quite fine quality masonry, as, as you see in front of you, on a, a great Macellum, a market building, so-called Site 11, excavated in the years before the First World War, but left unfinished for some reason. And um, the devastation uh, wrought by the plague in these years off offers a possible reason for that suspension of work, which was never resumed. Turning to the civil south of the province, um, a mass grave in the Watton Roman Cemetery in Gloucester uh, 
containing the remains of at least 91 individuals thrown haphazardly into a pit during the second half of the second century AD, all this excavated in um, the mid 2000, 2004 to six, uh, published in 2008. Uh, this has been um, tentatively and plausibly associated with the Antonine Plague. Well, turning these, turning aside from these speculations, I hope to have shown that the Housestead's dedication to the gods and goddesses in the collection of the Newcastle Antiquaries is part of a, a much wider story. The inscription from Ravenglass and the Newcastle Antiquaries own collection item from Housesteads are part of a general initiative to be dated around about 167. They belong to a time when the empire had been brought to its knees by a combination of military crisis and pandemic disease. Inspired by an oracle from far off Asia, the response of the emperor and his army was to appeal to the gods and to trust in the power of Apollo's arrows to save them from the pestilence. The Housestead's dedication thus illustrates the fascinating cultural connection between the personnel of a military unit stationed in remote Northumberland and the cities and sanctuaries of the Greek speaking East. Once we might have wondered whether these inscriptions indicated fear that the plague might come to Britain rather than its actual presence. But the amulet from London makes it much more likely that the infection had arrived. Very few people who visit the Great North Museum in Newcastle and see the Roman inscriptions there appreciate the import of this text from Housesteads. Um, please visit if you have an opportunity, if you're ever in the North, and take a closer look at this remarkable stone when in better times we're all able to return and study it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nick, for a, a most interesting parallel to uh, our current times. Um, first question I have is from Nick Summerton. Was there any reason for the dedication to be located at Halsteads? Might the finding there of a medicus and a hospital be of any relevance? Are there similar such findings at any other uh, of the dozen sites for these texts? Um, well, it's a, a very good point to make that um, at Housesteads, there is in fact, um, what the questioner refers to, there, there is the tombstone of um, a, a young medical officer um, Medicus. Um, I'm trying to remember his name. It may be Ingenuous, but I can't quite remember. Um, and Housesteads is one of very few forts, um, very few auxiliary forts in the empire, let alone in Britain, where um, a hospital building, a valetudinarium, has been um, not quite with certainty, but with a high degree of probability uh, identified. So certainly not all forts had hospitals. Um, and Housesteads does stand out in this uh, regard. Um, whether this is to be connected with the inscription that we've discussed is, 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 is another matter. 
I rather suspect not, um, partly because I believe that the raven glass uh, inscription indicates that this same dedication was probably made at all or very many Roman forts in the province, probably made by all, all the units, they're all told to do it. And secondly, when we think of the other fine spots in the empire, which um, tend to be cities and urban centers, um, these are places where um, doctors, medical specialists would have been commonplace. Um, all, 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 all towns would have had practicing doctors and all, um, all of the wealthier citizens would, would have had access to um, medic, have to pay for it, of course, but they'd have um, access to, to medical services. So I, I think my answer to the question is that um, medical provision, both in the Roman army and in uh, society as a whole, in the, or, or the well-off echelons of society in the ancient world was um, more widespread than we might imagine. Whereas I think these, these particular inscriptions um, were, were made at imperial behest and, and relate to a very um, specific set of circumstances. Thank you. Um, now, Alan Walker. Um, do the Gloucestershire remains show evidence of any common cause of death? I, I'm not aware that they do, um, but I'm afraid I have to um, uh, re refer the questioner to the published report. Okay. Um, John Lewis, our General Secretary. I visited the Raven Glass bathhouse site two years ago, but did the inscription come from a recent excavation at the adjacent fort? If so, what was found? No, the Raven Glass inscription actually comes from Moncaster Castle, which ah. is a a medieval castle site a short distance away. From robbing the site. Yes. Yeah. Um, so it is um, a, a more than reasonable um, inference that the inscription comes from the Roman site at Ravenglass, but we can't be more precise than, than that. Um, unfortunately, in the case of Housesteads as well, we, we we, all we know is that the inscription was first n noted there in 1807 um, by the antiquary Lingard. Um, the, the, the most information that he gives us is that it, it was in a ditch. And that's, that's all we know. Okay, Jeff Donnell, um, have you a map of inscriptions from the empire at large? I assume he means um, of this type. Um, it, it, do, it, do, does he mean, is there a map available anywhere? I, I, I assume so, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, if so, I haven't seen one. <laughs> but if, but the, the, the quick guide to knowledge, if, if, if you want to find where they all are, oops. Um, let me just uh, something up. Um, the, the study which um, first collected these inscriptions, or at least those that were available up to um, the mid 2000s, is in the Journal of Roman Archaeology for 2005. It's by C.P. Jones. And he lists um, all, all, all of the known inscriptions of this type. Um, now, obviously, a few more have come to light since, uh, for example, that at um, Ravenglass. But the, the, the general corpus is available in that article of 2005. So it would be a simple matter to refer to that and um, look, look up the places in an atlas. But I, 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 I 
don't recall that Jones himself, um, I could be wrong about this, but I don't recall that he um, reproduces a map which shows all the fine spots. Thank you. Um, one from me, perhaps. Um, is there any evidence that the, uh, the plague particularly um, affected the military and urban centers, given the, the greater potential for it spreading in, in barracks and in, in towns? Um, well, one would assume uh, th that it did, but in terms of real evidence, unfortunately, we only have the literary sources. And the, the, the literary sources, um, as I said in the talk, they connect the movement of the plague very strongly with the army mm. and the, the movement of the army from east to west. They're quite explicit about that. Um, but that, but that, 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 that is all the detail we get. So you're, you're quite right that um, a, a legionary fortress, um, when it had its whole legion in it of between five and 6,000 men would, would be a recipe for disaster as far yes. as um, uh, the spread of pandemic disease was concerned. Um, but sadly, none of our extant um, literary evidence um, descends to that kind of detail um, to do with specific, specific military units or places. Thank you. Um, from Nick Summerton again. Thank you. I also uh, know that Gloucester remains, and I discuss them in my current piece in the ARA News. The issue is that the bones show no signs of injury or malnutrition, and as many are young, it makes a plague such as smallpox lightly. Smallpox does not affect um, bones. Um, an observation, that obviously, that... Uh, uh, would, would would support the connection with the with the Antonine plague. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Alan Walker, a lot seems to depend on the Thames amulet. Um, could this not have been a lost item from anywhere? It must have been lost, presumably in London. So, yes. Well, it it. Uh, I mean, no, no one could pretend that this argument is a matter of proof. Um, it, it's simply a, a powerful straw in the wind. Um, but the strongest part of the argument is the material from which the amulet is made, which is pewter, um, which is considered to make it uh, more likely to have been produced in Britain than, than on the continent. Well, th thank you very much. Um, I, I think we the pandemic we're all living through helps us to visualize much more clearly how these um, diseases spread in the past. Um, the, the reference to it spreading in the air um, is, is particularly uh, now um, clear and paralleled in our, our present existence. Well, thank you very much again um, uh, for, for that fascinating um, parallel with the, the past. Um, now, I give notice that the next meeting will be on Thursday, the 3rd of December, 2020, when we will hear a paper, Changing Skins, Exploring the Use of Animal Products in Late Bronze and Early Iron Age Costume, a lecture by um, Dr. Peter Hommel. The meeting stands adjourned.